Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and this is September 26, 2014. This is episode number 172. Okay, and the title is Free Will, Its Refutation, Societal Cost, and Role in Climate Change Denial, Part 9. This is the ninth part of a series on this book that I published in April of this year, several months ago. Again, the title is Free Will, to Refutation, Societal Cost, and Role in Climate Change Denial. It basically just refutes free will and just, you know, just illustrates how it's not an inconsequential debate in, in, phys in, in philosophy. You know, the, the free will belief is harmful. It's harmful societally and it's harmful as an engine or catalyst of climate change denial, as I'll explain, you know, in future shows. But anyway, so right now we're, um, we're on page 21 and what we're doing is we're critiquing an experiment by the researchers Voos and Schooler who published a paper in 2008 titled um, The Value of Believing in Free Will, colon, Encouraging a Belief in Determinism Increases Cheating. So this, you know, as I mentioned last show, some re researchers acknowledging that they had lost the debate on whether we have a free will or not because of like such strong evidence as like <clears throat> with neuroscience, they decided to try to, you know, have society believe like, well, fine, we don't have free will, but if we believe we have free will, you know, it's going to like lead to, to more moral behavior. So actually, so they designed a series of experiments and I've been critiquing them because they're, they're flawed in various ways, okay? They're, they're very biased. I mean, if you're going to be a scientist, you should just like, you know, not introduce your biases into the research, but, you know, Whatever, I and mean, you can't blame them because they don't have free will. All right, so all right, so we're on the top of 21, page 21 of the book, and um, basically they have a second experiment, okay? And the problem with this experiment, I explained the problems in the previous one, is that like they used morality in the priming of subjects. Basically, they're they're taking two groups of subjects. One, they're priming to believe that they have a free will, and two, they're priming to believe that they don't have a free will. So the way they did that, they used these like Velton types of statements. Velton was a researcher who in 1968 published findings that demonstrated that you have, if you have a person read a list of statements, let's say the statements say, you know, I feel confident, I'm, I'm very self-assured, I, I feel very successful, I can achieve things, right? If you, you have a person read statements like that, chances are that on a test they'll behave or act more confidently or more successfully than if they were like primed or induced to believe, for example, that like, you know, nothing that I do matters, nothing ever works for me, I'm always making mistakes, whatever. So like, basically that's what these you know, these beliefs are about. So you can induce certain behaviors in people by priming them with, with of statements. So, all right, here's the problem with this experiment by Voos and Schooler. In the free will belief group, they, um, they use statements that included the following, quote, avoiding temptation requires that I exert my free will. Okay? But, the unfree will belief group read statements like, quote, a belief in free will contradicts the known facts that the universe is governed by lawful principles of science, end quote. Okay, the problem with this, you know, very poorly designed study is that it didn't also prime the unfree will belief group you know, to act morally. Okay, again, let me read the statement of, of, the, of the free will belief group. Avoiding temptation requires that I exert my free will. Okay, you, you, you understand how the, the priming wasn't just about free will in that statement, it was also about acting morally. So again, this is, you know, if they would have, like, if Voos and Schooler would have um, used morality relevant statements in both groups, or not used them at all, just tell one group they have free will and the other they don't, then the, the, the disparity, the, the disparity in, in the, the, the outcomes, because they tested it on cheating, and apparently the free will believers, you know, acted a bit, a bit more morally, and hard, not hardly at all, but just a bit, you know, then those results would have, would have just changed. It would, it would have had different result, results. Okay, but see, 
my much stronger criticism to these experiments is that like they're testing the free will belief versus the belief that everything is determined that we don't have free will in a very artificial setting in a laboratory setting where it's a very kind of like relatively it's an innocuous victimless crime of, of cheating on, a, on an experiment because like you know I didn't I, I mentioned in the last episode basically these two groups were then given an exercise and given the opportunity to cheat so like you know you know again the the, the ones the, the half of the group that were primed to believe they didn't have a free will and not primed to to act morally cheated a bit more than the the, the free will believers who were primed to act morally all right so um so like my, my stronger critique criticism is like that's you know if you want to like if you want to see the effect of belief in free will versus disbelief in free will no don't go to the lab go to actual examples of how people behave when they believe they have a free will when they when they um believe that things are up to them and uh, up or up to other people and when they don't okay so like what I did to kind of like demonstrate the harmful beliefs, uh, the harm that the belief in free will causes, is I went to research that, that um, explored blaming. Okay, now blaming is a reaction to people's immoral, negative behavior that requires the belief in free will. In other words, you can't logically, rationally blame someone for doing something that was absolutely out of their control you know with if they had an electrode implanted in them if they were like forced in whatever way you can't blame someone who didn't do something of their own free will and that, that that's a very very clear you know conclusion so i used that so basically i went through research that explored the effects of blaming in certain situations and i found preponderous evidence and this is just a small sampling there is so much evidence that to the extent we believe in free will that leads to blaming and that leads to far more harmful consequences that than if we didn't believe in free will now we don't have the, the research on disbelief in free will because they haven't really studied that you know but but you know just this research that limits itself to the belief in free will just basically actually um, in other words the more you blame someone Chances are the more you believe in believe in free will because they're so highly correlated. So anyway, like according to the research, um, more attributive blaming correlates with quote more aggressive and violent um, more aggressive and violent seeking of revenge and retribution. The more you believe in free will, the more aggressive you're going to be in in seeking revenge and retribution for for wrongs that are done in other words like if you don't if you understand nobody has a free will yeah you might have to address when somebody does wrong but if there's not going to be that that element of hate that element of vengeance that, that you know that that violence all right so like again the more you believe in free will the more you're willing to hate people and the more aggressive and violent seeking you know the more the more <laughs> the more aggressive and violent seeking um your your behavior is whatever <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna just act just much more um vengeful toward others all right um so all right it's gonna like again attributive blaming results in less forgiveness okay the the more you believe in free will when people do things that are wrong the less likely you're gonna um be to forgive them and i you know i i cite sources for this for example for the first ep um citation is like Folger and Barron 1996 Wickens Weisenthal Flora and Flett 2011 for the less forgiveness Bradfield and Aquino Menenzas and Greenberg 2011 Bradford and Aquino was um, 1999 so like these are these are like heavily heavily referenced and then if you go to like if you buy the Kindle version of this book it's only 99 cents I and mean, it's a great deal but you could probably you can find as I uploaded copies of this as a PDF that you can find on the internet for free so you know don't buy it if you don't have to so anyway it's so like we're on page 22 the more you, you know you blame people the more you believe in free will the more you're um, likely to blame people and that result results in more interpersonal conflict okay that's Cashmore and Parkinson 2011 DeBoard Lucas Fosco Rayner and Gritch 2010 Manessis and Greenberg again okay 
the more you blame people, the more you believe in free will, the more you blame people, the less compassion you're going to have um, toward people. In other words, like if people, like for example, this is horrible, I mean like the way we treat people throughout the world, you know, little kids that are like, you know, five years old and we deny them food and, and clean water and, and, you know, adequate, you know, health care and all, so many people that believe in free will say, well, you know, their, their parents shouldn't be having them, you know, like it's a very kind of like hateful, you know, free will based you know, blaming of the parents for having them. And so it, it leads to like less compassion toward these kids. So again, so, um, and th this is like the research on this was like published by Decidi, Eccles and Carroll, 2010, and Zucker and Wiener, 1993. Okay, the, the more you believe in free will, the less charitable you're going to be. Oh, because, because like, you know, if, if you blame people for their poverty because the, you, you, you assume they have a free will, you're going to say, well, I'm not going to give, you know, they deserve their poverty, you know, it's, it's up to them and all. So again, it, it leads to less charity, less charitable giving, um, more anger towards others. This, I mean, this, this makes so much sense. I and mean, we've done so many shows about this. If you believe in free will and somebody does something wrong towards you, you're not going to be angry at the universe that made them do that, which is the logical response. And who knows, maybe you can find a way around that. I mean, like if you consider, for example, that there's time goes back eternally into the past and there can never be like a point that we, at least logically, where we can say, well, this is where everything began. If you can't do that, then you can't come to a point where the universe made a decision to make a person do something, you know, that got you angry. So there's, there's actually even a way to absolve the universe, kind of. But, but certainly, you know, like if to the extent you understand that we don't have free will, you're not going to be angry at the person for doing whatever they did you're going to be angry if you're going to be angry at all at the universe okay and that that i think that the benefit of that is that it helps us maintain society maintain closer connections you know it makes us it helps us to not fight with each other as much because like you know there's so much there's so much animosity and stuff okay there's um more blaming self-blaming in this case the results from free will belief because again you can't rationally blame yourself from for anything that you believe was not done of your free will that you believe was completely compelled so the more you believe in free will the more likely you are to self blame and the more anxiety and, the, and depression that's going to create and that's um, CB and CB the Board, Lucas, Fosco, Rayner, and Gritch, Forey, Rauch, Morgan, Ellis, Jordan, and Thomas, 2011, Connor, Kotz, and Wright, 2011, and Raskowskas, 2011. So, you know, again, and this is just, you know, like, I didn't take much time to, to dig up this research. There's, there, there's volumes on research that demonstrates that, like, you know, the more you blame yourself and others, the more of this kind of behavior that, that's going to result. So, and, and the, the connection with this, like, so yeah, if you, if you believe you have a free will and you do something wrong, um, you're going to blame yourself and you're going to, like, punish yourself. We have this kind of, like, big, in other words, we learn this from our parents. When we do something wrong as kids, our pan parents punish us, you know? And so then, like, as adults, we, we learn to punish ourselves, you know, based on this, this belief, this mistaken notion that what we do is up to us, that we have a free will to, like, either do or not do whatever we do. So, again, well, to the extent that we, we, we blame ourselves and have free will, we are going to be more anxious because we're afraid. We're going to be afraid of making mistakes. I mean, that's, you know, what this anxiety is based on. And we're going to get more depressed because, like... One of, you know, I've, I've done, uh, my last series before this was on happiness. And like, for example, with happiness, there are four personality traits that correlate uh, most highly with happiness. And one of them is like self-esteem, okay? It's, um, but if you're blaming yourself, you know, for doing wrong things, that's going to like diminish your self-esteem, which is going to diminish your happiness and lead to depression, as these researchers, you know, um, cited. Okay, the, the more you, you blame, you know, based on this free will belief, the more arrogance you're going to feel and the more likely you will be to belittle others. This is on page 22. Again, very anti-social behaviors that, that, you know, that are the inevitable result to a great extent of this free will belief. Because, like, you can't, you know, you can't, 
people who believe, like in this case, people who believe they have a free will, they do something right or they, they think they're better than other people categorically because they have a free will. Okay, and then when, what happens that they, you know, they, they become arrogant, they look down on people, they make fun of other people. You know, the free will belief is divisive. You know, it divides people, divides society. It's very, very harmful. Okay, um, it leads to more self-blame and guilt, I think, as we just, like, described. Um, so it's, it's just like, so, so basically, would I, would I end this chapter, to, I guess it was a short chapter, and the next chapter is really the, um, the so we may get through this, like, sooner than I um, anticipated, but anyway, because we've got about uh, 11 minutes left. Um, but anyway, I, I end this last chapter, uh, chapter 4, with, with the statement that, uh, quote, interviewing persons convicted of crimes against persons known to them would likely to reveal that stronger belief in free will correlates highly with each of these responses. So, like, you don't even have to go to this research that's already been done. You go to people who have been convicted of crimes against people known to them, and you will find that the stronger the belief in free will the person has, because this, this strength of free will belief, you know, varies between individual the, the more vengeful, the more violent, the more aggressive, the more angry, the more um, unforgiving, you know, this, this person's behavior is going to be toward their victims and all. Okay, so it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a research that's very easy to conduct. And I imagine, you know, because, as I'll explain in my next chapter, this free will belief doesn't just, you know, harm our social relations. It also is um, a catalyst for climate change denial. You know, I think you'll be, you'll be seeing more research demonstrating its harm in order to get people to stop believing it so that maybe we can, like, face um, what's happening to the climate because it's like, you know, it's existential and who knows, maybe, maybe it's already too late to do anything about it, but, but the, the, the sooner we at least acknowledge that it's happening, the, the sooner we can address what, what we can address. And, you know, that can only be good, I mean. All right, um, page 25, last chapter. Free will belief and climate change denial. Okay, um, this is based, the premise for this, um, Pew Research, um, a polling company, a survey company, very well known, they did a, um, they published a report in 2014 um, that reported that Americans ranked global warming near the bottom of presidential and congressional priorities for the years 2009 through 2014. You know, there was like, the American public is saying like that everything else is more important or most of everything else is more important than addressing climate change and global warming. And that is a very seriously dangerous, threatening attitude for the American people to have because if the American people feel that way, there's absolutely no way the politicians are going to do anything about it. Okay, and the other part of what Pew Research reported is that only 44% of Americans believe, one, that climate change is happening, and two, that it is caused by human beings. All right? In other words, like, for, um, only 44% of the American public believe that those two things are happening. Some, some believe that climate change is happening, right? But they don't believe we're causing it, all right? But th this 44% relates to, like, Americans that both deny that climate change is happening and deny that, um, or, well, the 44% actually believe that climate change is happening and believe that we're causing it. So, like, 66% of us, two-thirds of us, are in denial about climate change. That is a very, very serious problem. You know, if we continue this denial, then what's going to happen is, like, our planet will warm to a point, it's, it's called, like, the point of no return, the point of irreversible global warming, after which it won't matter what we do, it won't matter how much we do, the planet will continue, the, the temperature will continue to rise and set set these feedback mechanisms and motions where, like, we won't be able to stop. And, and it's serious to the extent that, like, by 2100, you know, like, I, I, I'm, you know, this is in White Plains, New York. By 2100, this, the, the daily temperature here in New York State will, will exceed 100 degrees. I mean, like, each day. And so, like, that, and this is, like, both summer and winter. You know, and some, for other places in the world, then it's going to be much worse, 120, 30, 40. So, like, you know, it's a very, very serious um, problem and so like 
this, this chapter is about how free will belief is responsible for a lot of this denial. You know, that's, that's the thesis. And so let me get into that. Okay. And I get into it not just as a theory that I've just like developed on my own. I just, I, um, I pull in work by other researchers that has been done to try to explain the denial. And then what I do is I link it to free will belief. For example, again, we're on 25. Um, let me read this. Seeking a partial explanation for this indifference, you know, the 44%, you know, denial and just like believing that climate change is such a low priority on their, you know, agenda. Indifference for this denial. Crompton and Kasser in 2010 cited evidence that individuals overcome guilt about global warming by denying their actions, refusing to care, and shifting the blame to others. Okay, can you see the connection between free will belief and this, um, this denial? You know, in other words, like, they become guilty. If, if scientists are telling the world, you know, what you're doing is quite literal, well, destroying the, the quality of life, really destroying it in ways that we can't imagine, of, of, let's say, your great-grandchildren. I mean, it'll, you know, in other words, like, basically what we're doing is, is ending the civilization we know. There's no way we can, like, continue with the civilization we know when the temperature uh, is, is increasing, increasing each year, when the sea level is rising, when there's so many negative effects that, that, that arise from climate change, stronger hurricanes, more tornadoes, more wildfires, um, pandemics, what happens is like one of the most serious um, threats is like as the planet gets warmer, you have these microorganisms that are pathogens that are like dangerous to human beings. And like, for example, in, in this temperature, they might have, let's say, one breeding season a year. OK, they, they breed and then they, they replicate themselves. You have more of them. But like as it gets hotter, they may have two or three or four breeding seasons a year, meaning there's many more of them, meaning that, you know, we're, we're, we're just subject like to these pandemics that, just, you know, could just literally extinct us. I mean, you know, people remember like the Black Plague, the, you know, the, the Black Death and all these, these, these plagues, the, um, the Spanish flu that, that killed millions and millions of people. You know, the Spanish flu, I believe, killed more, more people than World War I. It, it occurred around 1918. So climate change is not just affecting the climate. It's also affecting these kinds of what they refer to as disease vectors. Okay? So again, you know, when, when people, are, when the scientists are telling people that what we're doing, what your neighbors and your family and your friends are doing to the planet is causing such such a dire, un unimaginable future for, for, for so many people, that's, that's a threat most people can't handle. And the reason they can't handle it is because they believe in free will. If the scientists said to these people, listen, um, yes, these things, what we're doing is threatening the planet in this way, in, the, in a way that has never been threatened, at least in, in terms of human history before, um, but it's not our fault. In other words, like, we don't have a free will. Human beings do not have a free will, so it would be mistaken and wrong to blame ourselves for it. Fine, it would still be unpleasant. It would be see, still be something that we'd need to act on, but people wouldn't be blaming themselves, and if they wouldn't blame themselves, they wouldn't have to resort to denial. They would, they would, they would be able to say, fine, all right, it's not our fault. But yes, the evidence, preponderance of evidence demonstrates climate change is happening. 97, 98 percent of scientists believe that it's happening and that we're causing it. Let's let's start acting on it. Let's let's stop denying that it's happening. So again, the, the belief in climate change and the belief in free will is harmful not just in terms of um, in terms of our interpersonal interactions, as I explained before. It it actually fuels this climate, again, like two-thirds of Americans are in denial that climate change is happening and that we're causing it. And, and if they didn't believe in free will, it's not going to like, you know, overcoming our belief in free will is not going to like result in everybody being in, um, overcoming their denial about it. Because like, for example, some people will deny it because it's just too, um, too horrible a fate to, to imagine. Some people will deny it, for example, like, 
rich oil company executives will deny it because, well, they're making way too much money, you know, selling us fossil fuels and, and, and obstructing our, um, our political will to, to fight climate change. So there's like, there's some self-interest involved in denying climate change. There's some actual like fear of, of you know, something unimaginable. But I would, I would suspect, and we need to do research because this research has not, be done, has, has not been done. That's the purpose of this book. We need to, to know exactly or within a, a certain parameters how much of this denial is based on the free will belief. Because like if it turns out that let's say only, only 20 or 30 percent of the denial is based on free will belief, that's that's not just only 20 or 30. That's that's a major major segment of the population because like you know the the kind of um, action we need to initiate on climate change requires everybody to get on board. It requires not just that 44 percent of people understand um, that that um, that free will that. Um, climate change is happening that we're causing it, it's going to require that at least 90, 95 percent of not just the people in this country, but people throughout the world understand and acknowledge it, you know, just are not in denial about it. Okay, um, we've got about a minute to go. All right, so that's, um, that's all I'm going to get into this part. So like next episode, I'll get into more of the research that, um, that ties, you know, free will belief at to climate change denial and just like explains how it's a very serious, you know, um, problem we need to address because of this. All right. Well, thanks for watching. Um, again, the show is on on Thursdays here in White Plains. We have uh, our Manhattan show on MNN every Wednesday at 11 o'clock. It's a call-in show. So except that we've got this great guest now. He believes in free will, but like he's really intelligent. Most people who believe in free will, they're just not very intelligent. I mean, you can't blame them. But like, so we're having a very kind of like good dialogue. You know, we had we had a show kind of like on Wednesday. That's why like if I'm if I feel if if I seem stressed out and tired, it's because I am. Because like I've been going on full throttle. I can get home to like you know two o'clock on on Wednesday night, whatever. Anyway, or uh, Thursday morning. So that's all we have time for. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time on Exploring Illusion Free Will. Thanks.